our opening prayer today. Awesome. Thank you. Dearly Father, we're grateful for this wonderful day today. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to learn from Brother Birch. And please bless this lesson that we'll be able to learn the things that we need to for this week. Please bless that we'll be able to continue to listen to the words of the prophets and to, to read thy scriptures. We're grateful for thee and all thy many blessings. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Samuel. All right. So here is my plan for today. Uh, I want to go through the exam. I'll just kind of like walk through all the questions pretty quick. If you guys have any questions about them, uh, just stop me and we can go into depth on any one of them. Uh, and then we might write some code for, for the ending part of the exam. I think we have time to. Um, and then after that, let's see, we're going to go into chapter six and kind of move forward with selection. This is going to be a great week. Uh, so let me share my screen real quick. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Okay. Uh, within an electrical circuit, what does a diode do? It allows electricity flow to flow in one direction only. What does a power supply do? Convert, convert alternating current to direct current. What does a bus do? It transfers data. Uh, what version of HTML will we use in this course? Let me grab my text editor here. The answer is HTML5. Just like that. Um, uh, let's see here. Let's move this to a good spot. All right. Um, write the HTML5 document type dec declaration as it should appear at the top of all HTML5 documents. Uh, the answer for that one is doc type HTML. Um, what are the two main sections that every HTML5 document must have? They're the head and body. Uh, what is the tag that ends an HTML document? This one, whoops, no, that's wrong, sorry. Uh, HTML, the closing HTML uh, tag. Uh, write the HTML tag that makes a text field that can be used by this JavaScript statement. Okay, so the main thing here is our JavaScript statement is searching for an input with an idea of address. So I'd have to say input, oh, this isn't an HTML document, input type text, and then I would say ID equals address. Okay, so that's the answer for that one. Uh, write the HTML tag that makes a text field, oh, we just did that one. Uh, write the opening HTML tag that makes a div that can be used by this JavaScript statement. Okay, so same thing. It's looking for an ID of output. Whoops, that needed a closing quotation mark there. Um, so we'd have a div with an ID of output. And, oh, it just says opening HTML tag. So I wouldn't need the closing there, just that opening one. Uh, number 10, what does document.getElementById function do? It finds an element within an HTML document. Uh, what does parse int do? It converts a text to an integer. Uh, what does let do? Reserve space in the computer's memory for a variable. Okay, I've gotten a couple of questions about this. The difference between var, let, and const. Um, these are all different ways to do that. Reserve space in the computer's memory uh, for a variable. Uh, JavaScript variable has which of the following? Um, delay is not a thing. Okay, so they all have a name, a value, and a type. So if I say uh, var age equals 25, okay, um, we have a variable name, we have a value of 25, and then the type isn't explicitly declared here, like it is in some languages where we would say int age equals 25. Um, but if I were to if I were to access this like from a debugger, uh, it would say that it is an integer. And there are JavaScript functions where I could actually like alert the type of a variable and it would be integer. Uh, after computer executes the following code, variable height will be of what type? Okay, so we got height from an input box, which would be a string by default. And then parse float will convert that string to a number. 
Um, after the following JavaScript code executes, what value will the variable y hold? Okay, um, and it is 12. Given the following JavaScript code, what will the value of result be? Okay, I had several people asking about this. Um, let me open up my developer tools right here. Look at this hideous console. Come on, Canvas. So I'm gonna clear that and, and use this. So I'm gonna say let A equals one, B equals three, and C equals negative two. Okay, so those are all def defined. If I just type in A, um, it'll show that it's one. And then let result equals A plus B times seven modulus four minus C. And then I can type in result and see that we get four. Okay, so if I was taking my test and I'm allowed to use these developer tools, I would have done just that. Uh, if you didn't do that, you're like, how on earth did we get four? Let's walk through this. So order of operation says that we're gonna multiply B times seven first. B is three, so that's 21. 21 modulus four, four goes into 21 five times, but we just care about what's left over. So 21 modulus four is one, all right? Then uh, plus and minus addition subtraction have the same level of precedence. So we'll go from left to right. So we'll say one plus one minus negative two. So we have one plus one is two, minus negative two, the double negative makes a positive. So it's basically two plus two, uh, which lands us at four. All right, next one. After the following code is executed, what value will the variable Z hold? Okay, uh, 4.2 times three, and we're gonna round that. So um, again, I could just say let X equals 4.2, whoops and let y equals three, and the math, let z also, math.round x times y. And I can see what z is, and it's 13. All right, if I wanted to do this bit by bit, I can see 4.2 times three gives us this guy, and that math.round will just round it the way that you would expect to 13. Uh, translate the following algebraic expression into JavaScript. All right, so let's just look at each one of these. There are two main ways that you could go about this. One is just writing it out on your own, um, where there's a bunch of different ways that you could write this out on your own. I would probably start with just looking at these different options and canceling them out. Uh, this one, for example, I can cancel out immediately because, whoops, because if you place the number three next to a variable n, it will throw you a JavaScript error. Okay, that multiplication has to be explicitly done with an asterisk. Okay, so A is out. Uh, let's look at our next one, okay, which we can see is the correct answer, but we have three times N minus, and we have 17 times C times C. So 17 times C squared, which is good. Um, and then divided by R plus five, and this R plus five is in parentheses, making that happen first. So according to order of operations, this three times N would happen independently uh, 17 times C squared would happen independently. R plus five would happen independently. And then this division would take place uh, before this subtraction. And so this would be good, okay? Let's look at the next ones to see why they're wrong. So we have three times N minus, let's see, uh, right here, math.pow, we're saying two to the exponent of C. Those are swapped, okay? It should be C to the exponent of two. Um, other than that, C would be good. Okay, there's nothing else in C that would make it wrong. It's just that the two and the C are, are, swi are switched. Um, the next one, three times N minus 17 times C squared, good, divided by R plus five. Uh, so right here, we would have to have the R plus five in parentheses. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is after all of this takes place, whatever we end up at, we'll add five onto. And that's not what our math is saying here. Um, that will actually go into the division uh, of this fraction. Okay, so we have to have that last chunk in parentheses. All right, rewrite the following JavaScript statement so that it uses the plus equals operator. Okay, uh, so what that would look like is just balance plus equals interest. Okay, and that'll be the exact same thing. Uh, next one, rewrite this one so it does not use the decrement operator. Okay, um, so that I can say, say x equals x minus one, okay? Uh, one of the exams that I graded, it, it, it did this, x minus one, 
all right? Uh, that's only halfway right and only halfway wrong, okay? Uh, yes, that is what this does, but it also reassigns it back to X. If I do this, um, let's say I say um, bar X equals 20. Okay, sorry, X equals 20, okay? And I say alert X, see my pop-up says 20. All right, now if I, I say uh, alert X minus one, okay, it alerts 19. So it did take off one from that. But if I say alert X again, it's 20. It didn't change X. If I use X minus minus, it will change X. Okay, it will be X equals X minus one. It will take one off of the current value of X and assign it back to X. All right, which of the following are control structures? Remember control structures change how the code runs. The default control, stru control structure is just top to bottom. Um, and all of these will change that. So sequence, selection, repetition, try, catch, throw. Uh, we talked about these in, I think it was week two or four. I can't remember, it was probably four. I don't remember, uh, but we did talk about these. Input, computation, storage, output. None of these will actually change the order at which our code will be executed. All right, uh, let's write this code real quick. Um, I'm just gonna copy this HTML. Oh, it's not gonna let me, that's a bummer. Uh, that's okay, we'll use our own code. Okay, let me open up a file. <clears throat> that is not the right class. I'm gonna grab my template and I'm gonna copy everything here, make a new file and save it. And I will just call this uh, tempexam.html, it's already there. And I'll hit okay. All right, so in here, I'll go ahead and change my title to rate of change like it has there. And then let's see, the program allows the user to enter a previous and current price. Here's our formula that we're gonna do. We need to work with real numbers, so we'll use parse float and Okay, so this function or this code right here, uh, to change this, the inputs are good. We'd have to put an onClick attribute instead of our div to call a function and then write the function here. Okay, and we'd also have to write a defining table. So let's start with that. Uh, input is current price and uh, previous price. Okay, our output is rate of change. And then our processing is current price minus previous price and all that divided by previous price. Okay. Uh, in here, I'm going to change template function. I'm going to hit control D to select both of these at the same time. And I'll just call this uh, calculate, whoa, calcu calculate rate of change. And I don't need a header input, uh, their inputs had an ID of previous price and current price. Okay, and I'll just put a placeholder in each of these of that same thing. Okay, so if I copy this path and run it in my browser, oops, sorry, um, you can see here's what the placeholder does. Whatever text I put in that placeholder attribute, it'll show it in this input. And right now my function won't do anything. Um, probably through an error just now. Yeah, it did. So uh, let's go back and let's fix this. Um, so in here, I'm gonna need two of these. And one is gonna be for previous price. I'll put that right there and I'll just call it the same variable name even though I could call this anything. I'm gonna copy that line and paste it. And I'm gonna replace previous price with current price. Uh, both of these I'm going to have to parse float because we're working with real numbers. Okay. And then we don't need a message right here. Instead, we're just going to have some processing. And so I'm going to say var rate of change equals, and I'm just going to copy this because that should work for us. And then we're going to output rate of change. I just want to make sure this output div exists because I didn't pull from their template and it does. And I'll come back over here, refresh, and I'll say $10, $20, run function, and it says our rate of change is one. OK, 
Okay, and I could I could test this again with different numbers if I wanted to, and it would give us those numbers. Okay, any questions on this? I know it went quick because you guys had plenty of time to look at it during your exam, but hopefully seeing me go through this helps. So, all right, next one. Write a defining table in a computer program that computes and outputs the volume of a torus with inner radius and outer radius B. A donut is an example of a torus. Your program must read the inner radius and outer radius. I'm just gonna do that right now. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna change this to torus. And then we'll say inner radius and outer radius. And we know that it's gonna output the volume of the torus. Oh, okay, and then here's the formula for a torus. So I'm gonna change this um, and I'm gonna call this, what do they call it? Let's see, uh, V is the volume eh, or that's pi. A is the inner radius, so I'll just call that A to be consistent with them and B is the outer radius. So in here, I can just kind of copy their formula. So I'll say uh, pi squared, um, times and then in parentheses a plus b and then times a minus b and then squared okay uh does this squared exponents happen first in algebra so this squared will just happen to uh this set of parentheses if i'm mistaken someone correct me Okay, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true. So I'm just gonna say times uh, A minus B. Uh, and then all of this, I'm gonna put in a parentheses because we have to divide it by four for our denominator. And that should give us the volume, okay? Uh, this function I'm gonna change to calculate volume of torus. We can leave the run function the same. Uh, this, I'm going to hit control D a few times to change all of them into inner. And then I'm going to do the same thing for current price for outer. Okay, so I just changed uh, what ID we're grabbing. I changed the ID down here. I changed the placeholder, the variable name that it's called. This we're just going to delete because that's, we don't need that. Okay, so I'm going to say bar volume equals, and then volume I'll put here for our output. And then we have math.pi. And if I wanted to square this the right way, I could say, well, a correct way to, to square it, I could say math.pow. We have math.pi to the exponent of two. Okay. And then all of this, I should just be able to copy. And I just have to put this opening parenthesis right there. All right. Now, if this doesn't work, if this math is incorrect, because I wasn't super confident about this, I'm relatively confident. Um, but if it doesn't work, at least we have these test cases. And if something's wrong, then we can kind of play around with it for a second until we get it right. All right, come back over to my browser. I'm gonna run this. And let's check one of their test cases, 2.8 and 3.1. So 2.8 and 3.1, A is not defined, okay? So we called inner A and outer B because that would have been our next error that would have shown up because we didn't declare, declare B either. So let's run this again, 2.8 and 3.1. Okay, and we get 1.31. Okay, so that looks good, uh, but they did round it a little bit. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, I don't really like to round math because if I ever wanted to use this number later on, I would want a, a, as accurate of number as possible. So right here, I'm just gonna say volume dot two fixed two. Okay, this will return a string like it's showing right here, um, but it will output my number to two decimals. Okay, so I'm gonna come back over here, refresh 2.8, 3.1, and there's that 1.31, okay. So Brother Birch, if we didn't round it on our test, if we just uh, left it unrounded, is that, was that okay or no? <laughs> Thank no. you for asking that, Shira, because I didn't round. <laughs> yeah, so the only reason why I rounded was just because I'm looking at this test case. It didn't say that you should round it, okay? Uh, but anytime you see something with test cases, you want to get your output to match it. Um, so if you got that that large decimal like I got before I used two fixed, um, you might lose a point. Um, 
So because I went I went back and read the instructions like really carefully because I was trying to round and couldn't get it to work. So yeah. I went back and read the instructions like, you know, it doesn't say I need to round it so yeah. that I just left that whole thing off that I was trying to do because I couldn't get it to work. And I wanted to turn in something that at least worked instead of it's more important. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you, you might lose a point um, just because whenever you have test cases like this, you should match it. Um, but you did the hard part of trans of converting that algebra to JavaScript. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, great question. All right, you guys, that was your exam. Any other questions? Sweet. Well, then, I am really excited to go into chapter six because this stuff is awesome. All right. Uh, what is selection? A computer program needs to know how to make decisions. Evaluating if a condition is true or false uh, is how we generally have computers do that. A selection statement is also called an if statement. So uh, to, to use if statements effectively, we have to learn about conditional operators. All right. Uh, you can see that there are some examples here of how we can use an if statement in JavaScript. Uh, thankfully, we speak English and JavaScript was written by people who speak English as well. So uh, we have the word if, which is really nice for us. So I can just say, if I is less than three, then I would have an optional block of code that will execute. Uh, and if it's not less than three, then I won't execute that block of code. So let's look at a very simple example. Uh, right here, we're getting the volume of a torus, okay? Uh, let's say I wanted to add some error checking in here. I could say, if A um, is less than zero, Okay, uh, then I could say um, alert, please enter a valid number. Okay, hard to compute the volume of something that is a negative, right? Um, so let's look at this and let's see what happens. So I'm gonna come back over to my browser, over to here. I don't have any errors showing up in my console and I'm gonna say 2.8 and 3.1, still works just fine, nothing happened. Okay, well now let's trigger that event and I'll just say negative, one and i'll hit run function and now it says please enter a valid number okay so that's pretty cool because anytime i want code to conditionally run based on any condition uh, i could put that in here okay uh, but generally we use um these relational operators now i could say something like uh if a okay now this doesn't have any relational operators what this is going to check for is to see if A exists. And if it exists, and if there's anything in A, it could be anything, um, then that'll be true. Uh, one exception to that, so let's come into here, and I'm going to refresh this, and I'm going to say uh, negative 1 and 3.1. And you said you see it still says, please enter a valid number. Um, and if I said 5, it says, please enter a valid number. Because either way, it sees that A exists. All right, if I enter zero, it doesn't show up, okay? And that's because if we enter zero, then it sees this as false, all right? We've talked about Boolean variables where I have var is happy equals true. That is a Boolean variable, all right? If I put is happy in here, then every single time that I run this, uh, is happy is gonna be true and it'll go into that if block of code. If I say if happy or is happy equals false, and I refresh the page and I run the function, it'll never have that pop up because it's false. Okay, so you can use if statements with a Boolean variable like this. All right, but more often than not, you will see it um, with these relational operators, something very similar to these. So let's look at them real quick. Uh, we have a lesser than and a greater than, lesser than or equal to, greater than or equal to is equal to and is not equal to. All right, so I could come back into here and I could be like, uh, I wanna make sure that A is not equal to B. Okay, so anytime I put anything in here, as long as A is a different number than B, then we'll have this alert. And so if I come into here and run it and I have three and three, it didn't execute it. If I have two and three, then it says it, it executed that code. All right, and I could put, Pretty much anything in here that I wanted to. Okay, I could say if a is greater than a thousand, alert. This is a huge torus. Okay, I could do anything I wanted to. 
All right. So selection statements or if statements. So right here, we declare balance at 560. And I say, if balance is greater than 500, um, then I would declare interest. And I'd say interest is equal to balance times 0 0.03. And then we would add that interest onto balance. If balance is less than 550, then I could do something else. In this case, I just said, bar this is crazy, equals true. All right. So these, um, it, it can be interesting having multiple if statements because depending on the condition that you make, you might go into both blocks of code. Now, in this example, uh, if it's greater than 500 or less than 550. So if I put in 530, then everything in here would get executed. And we can test this out. I wonder if I have this written somewhere. Uh, chapter six. I do not have it written. That is OK. All right, so let's come over here. And I'm just going to say, uh, if A is greater than 1,000, then I'll have another if statement down here. And I'll say, if A is less than 1,500, um, and I'll just say alert. This is crazy. All right. So I'm going to leave that open. And I'm going to open this up. And I'm going to refresh the page. And inner, I'm going to say is uh, 1100. And run function it says this is a huge torus coming from right here because A is greater than 1000. And I hit OK. The code continues to execute. And it's like, oh, A is also less than 1500. So this is crazy. OK, and I could have as many of these if statements as I wanted to. Uh, if else statements, OK? I, I said a second ago that if statements, if I have a bunch of if statements one after the other, it can get kind of confusing. OK, so generally what we will see is an if else statement. All right, now what this will do is it will force it to only go into one of those blocks of conditional code. All right, so I would never have something like um, right here. Uh, if I made this an else statement instead, then if A is greater than 1,000, if it's 1,100, then it will alert this. And then it will skip this no matter what it is. OK, um, and I I actually wouldn't have a condition here uh, with an else statement. But but anytime you go into a block of one of these codes, uh, you would never go into anything else. So if this condition is met, you go in there and you skip everything else. If this condition isn't met, then this will get executed no matter what. OK, that's what our else statement is for. So right here, uh, you use an if else statement when you have a true choice and a false choice. So sales is 1250, you either get a bonus or you don't. If sales is less than or equal to 1000, then the bonus will be 20 bucks. And if it's more than 1000, then you'll get 100 bucks. Okay. And then if our salary will be sales times 0.1, 10% commission, I guess, plus whatever bonus you get, depending on how many sales you have. All right. Any questions on this? Sweet. All right, well, let's keep going then. If, else, if, else, okay? When you have more than two choices, okay? So in our last example, uh, you either got a bonus of 20 bucks or a hundred bucks, okay? Well, let's say we had a huge company with like 10 different tiers of bonuses, which is usually probably the case, all right? Um, then I might have an if statement with a bunch of else if statements and an else statement, okay? There is no limit to how many else if statements I have. So um, my previous condition here was, it would have been written like this, else if A is less than 1500. Okay, and I could have another alert here that says uh, entering else if statement. All right, now, right here, what will happen if I type in 1100 for A? What alert will we get? Just the first one? Just the first one. You rocked it, Diana. Nice work. So let's run this. I'm going to refresh it. 
I'm going to type in 1100 and hit run function. This is a huge torus, line 28. Hit OK. The rest of my function ran. This was like, that's not a number because whatever. OK, because I didn't give it an outer value. Now, let's debug this and let's see how this works. And let's watch it work. I'm going to put a breakpoint on the first line inside of my function so I can see every single line execute that I want to see executed. All right, I'm going to run the function. Uh, is happy is fault. That's sad. I'm going to change that to true for next time we run this. Okay, not that we're using it. Uh, and then we're parsing our inner input. Whoops, wrong window. Let's stop that. All right. So A is 1100. B is undefined or not a number. Okay. We try to parse an undefined value and that's where our not a number is coming from. Okay. Now is A greater than a thousand? Now I can highlight this from A to the end of a thousand and see that that equates to true. Anytime you're working with an if statement, whatever goes inside those parentheses is going to equate to true or false. That's how our program knows whether it should execute whatever's coming next or not. Can you guys hear me okay? Looks like I'm breaking up. Okay, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so that equated to true. And so if I hit F10, we'll go into there. And then if I hit F10 again, you can see it ran the alert function and it ran this. And now look what line of code it jumped to. It didn't care about all this. It ran the if statement. And because this is true, it'll just skip over everything else. And then it'll jump down to line 36. Okay, now let's try this again. Uh, in here, I'm gonna change my else, my else if statement to say, if A is less than 800. All right, and I'm gonna refresh this page and I'm gonna say 7.99 and run it. Is happy is true. A is 7.99, B is not a number. Is A greater than 1,000? False, so we skip it. Is A less than 800? True, so we go in there, entering else if statement alert, and then it jumps to line 36, same as we did before. F8 to get out of there. Next one, I am going to do uh, 800, and we're gonna run this. All right. Uh, whoops, sorry, I skipped that. Okay, A is 800. Is 800 greater than 1,000? No, that's false. Is 800 less than 800? Also false. And then we jump into our else statement, which will always encapsulate, encapsulate everything. If it doesn't go into the if statement or the else if statement, that's why you have the else statement. Because if I didn't have that, what if someone puts 900? I want a condition for everything. Otherwise, my program will break depending on what a user puts in. And I don't want that. All right, so F8, uh, this is crazy. And we get this last alert. Okay, so that is how an else, an if, else, if, else block works. Now I could have several of these. And I could say, if it's less than 800, if it's less than 801, if it's less than 900, okay? If I had a bunch of conditions, I can put them all in here and I can make my program work very specifically um, to exactly what I want it to do. All right, switch statements. Use this when a lot of choices exist, all right? So if we look back at my code right here, um, yes, this works, but every single else if statement has three lines of code at a minimum, which isn't super enjoyable, okay? Uh, this will make my code really big if I end up with a company that has 10 different types of bonuses, all right? So we use switch statements when there are a lot of choices that exist and lots of different things that I would say based on um, some input. Each choice is based on the same variable and uses a double equals, all right? So you can't always use switch statements. In this example, I can use switch statements because if I look at every single one of these, well, it might be kind of hard to use switch statements um, because there are two, two, two ways that you can use a switch statement, okay? Uh, or two things that have to be true to use it. Uh, you have to be using the same variable every single time. All right, uh, you'll learn about this later, but I could also say, and B is greater than five. All right, I can have multiple conditions in here. I can't do that with a switch statement, okay? A switch statement, I can only be using one variable, which is right here. And the other, the other thing that has to be true is that we can only use uh, our double equal sign, 
which is to say uh, that a is equal to something. So if this was a is equal to a thousand, a is equal to 800, 801, 900, then I could very easily convert this into a switch statement. Okay. But using the lesser than and greater thans or any other relational operator, I can't do a switch statement. So you can't always use it. Um, can you always use an if, else if, else block if you want to? Yes. There's never a situation where you can't use an if, an if statement. Okay. Uh, they are much more versatile. Uh, but like we saw, they will use up more code at times um, in conditions where you could use a switch statement. So let's look at a switch statement running. Um, do I have this written? Man, why don't I have this written? Okay, I'm gonna make a new file real quick. Well, I'll just use this one. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take all of this out of here. Um, and I'm, we're even going to take this function out of here also. Um, and we're going to take all of this out of here too. We don't care about any of it. All right. So what we're going to do, I'm going to say switch uh, class standing. Now, if I run this right now, we're going to get a big error because class standing isn't defined. So I'm going to say, uh, is there a prompt function in JavaScript? Let's Google this real quick. Uh, JavaScript, I think it's just prompt, prompt for input, window prompt, it is prompt, okay. Uh, this is kind of like an input, except it has, or sorry, it's not, it's kind of like an alert, except it also has um, a way for you to type in a value, okay. So really easy way to get, to get um, data. So we're just going to say prompt, and I'll say, please enter your class standing. All right, and then we'll assign this to our class standing. All right, then this will be declared. Now, if we look at this, come back over to our Taurus application. Okay, that's what our prompt looks like. It's an alert with the text box and I'll say F and that was it, okay. All right, now let's come back over here and let's start typing this stuff out. So uh, case F, then, whoa, then register date equals November 23rd. Break. All right. Here's what, here's, here's one condition. All right. Now we talked about how a switch statement will use that double equals, no matter how it's being used, it'll always be double equals. So this, this will be true if for class standing, if I typed in just a capital F, then it would come into here, it would assign register date. Uh, for this code to work, we have to declare register date. So I'm just going to say register date and not assign it anything. We'll leave it like that for now. Then at least this will work. And I don't have to declare using the var or let or const vary or names um, every time I go into a case statement. And you just said that it's case sensitive, right? This is case sensitive, yes. So you would need to make something to like, like this pretty put a lowercase f. You would need to yeah yes Beforehand. yeah like yeah okay. there wouldn't be any way for me to be like or lowercase f okay. Nope. okay that's not going to work in javascript and so yeah if i wanted them to be able to put in a lowercase f or a capital f then i would have to do this do it just another line or make it make it uh make it work yep and then break that's how i'd have to do it thank Would're you which isn't very nice. Yeah, thank you for thank you for asking that. That's a great question. Whoops. All right, let's make a couple of other cases here. I'll say uh, case S, and then we'll say register date equals November seventeen. Break. Does anybody know what the break does? It lets you break out of the function. Because if you don't have that, it just keeps going. Great. Yeah. So the way a switch statement works is as soon as one of these is found to be true, then it will execute that line of code. And then it will execute every single line of code after that, unless I have a break statement. Okay. I don't know why it is that way. It's just how it is. All right. But if I have a switch statement, I have to put break on every single one of these. Otherwise, 
Uh, let's say the user types in a lowercase f. We'll say, okay, register date is November 23rd. Nope, it's November 17th. Nope, it's November 12th, it's November 6th. It'll execute all those, unless I put that break there. All right. Now, the one thing that is nice about that is because at the very end, I have default. Okay. This is like our else statement in an if else block. All right. Anytime I'm in a switch statement and none of these conditions are met, then I have something to encapsulate everything else just to make sure that um, I have a register date being assigned no matter what. Okay. And in this case, I would say none. Um, so let's run this real quick and we'll run it in a debugger so we can look at it. All right, enter your class standing. I'm going to put uh, a capital S. Okay, so class standing is a capital S. And I'll hit F10. And you can see it just jumps straight to there. Now, if this was an if else if block, it would have touched every single one of those lines of code. Well, not every single one, but each time I say if or else if, else if, it would have touched each one of those on my breakpoint. So switch statement, just by looking at this, I can see that a switch statement will perform better. So if you have a huge application with millions of lines of code, uh, maybe it would be worth looking into switch statements to help with your performance where possible. All right, for everything in this class and the majority of the stuff that you will do in programming, you'll probably be just fine to use an if else block, okay? Um, a lot of people like switch statements, a lot of people don't. Uh, I'll be honest, I very rarely use them. I have nothing against them. Uh, except, you know, like, like this example right here. If I was going to write this in an if statement, I could say if class standing is equal to F. All right. So this by itself looks a little bit more cumber cumbersome because I have that double equals there instead of just case. Uh, but I can also say or class standing is equal to a lowercase f. Okay. And then I could just say register date is equal to November 23rd. All right, and I don't have to have a break. So these three lines of code just did what these six lines of code did. All right, and they do the exact same thing. So it's it's a very, nah, excuse the pun, uh, case by case basis. All right, um, sometimes it, it makes more sense to use a switch, other times it just doesn't. All right, but it's important to know that they exist and it's important to know how they work. All right, and I, I am well aware that we haven't gone into how that works. I also showed you guys um, the and operator as well. Um, we, we will go into those. So I have a question. Yeah. With, with um, can you use both of them? Like, could you do an if statement and for that, for those six lines of code and then go into the um, switch statements? Uh, maybe not in the way that you're intending. Um, but in my code, if I wanted to, uh, I could have um, like a switch statement in here. Let's say I had another variable and it was like uh, last name, first letter. If a registration date was based on two things, for example, it was based on uh, your class standing and it was based on your last name and what your last name starts with. Um, then I could have like, whoops, I could have like a switch statement inside of an if statement. All right. But this whole thing, even if it's like 50 lines of code for my switch statement, would never get touched if this wasn't true, you know? So I can't have, you know, like a switch statement and then all of a sudden I'm throwing in uh, if register date is equal to J. I can't do that. That would give me a nice big ugly error. Um, but if I did want to nest them like this, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so that brings us into, well, let's look at this example real quick. So odd and evens, we'll just look at some code. Okay, so I'm going to copy this file path and we can run it and we'll see what it's doing first. Paste, please enter an, int an integer. I'll say 51 is even and it says 51 is an odd integer. Really simple program. Let's see what it's doing. All right, so. Um, Let's see here. So is even looks like that was called when we hit the button is even. We can verify that by looking at the button in the HTML uh, right here. Is even, we have an on click uh, or on the button, we have an on click that calls our is even function. It'll go into here. We get text 
uh, document dot get element by id integer input box which is pulling from here we parsed it into a number and then we said uh we declared message and i said if number modulus two is equal to zero so remember modulus gets us the remainder after division so 51 modulus two uh two goes into 51 25 times and then there's one left over okay so uh number modulus two is equal to one so that would be false which means it would skip this line of code and then it would go into here and i'd say message equals number 51 plus is an odd integer and then we just output that okay uh let's put a breakpoint right here and let's watch this happen so i'm going to put 50 in here now and i'm going to click on that button uh we have number of 50 message is currently undefined even though it is declared and then we say 50 modulus 2 that equals zero. So if I highlight this whole thing, it will equate to two true, which means we'll go into this line of code. Message will get this value. 50 is an even integer. Hit F10, it skips over this else block, and then it's ready to output um, that 50 is an even integer to the page. Okay, questions on this one? Sweet. All right, well, let's keep going then. Uh, quadratic formulas. Ooh, we're going to skip over this one for now. Uh, if, if you want to see my code for, for doing this, if you're like really into math, uh, here's my code for doing this. Um, you can see that I have a very simple if statement right here. And then we have a lot of math. Okay. Um, and we are producing uh, several roots for our quadratic formula. So if you're interested and want to look more into this, uh, there's the recording. You can pause as much as you like. Uh, finding roots in JavaScript. Just looked at nested if statements. OK, this gets into things that are much more applicable on a day to day programming basis. Uh, I don't think I've ever had to write the quadratic formula in code uh, professionally or educationally um, outside of this class. Uh, but nested if statements happen all the time. So let's look at this. Uh, we have input total weekly sales for a person processing use the table to output or to compute commission output is the sales the salesperson's commission. So here we have this table if the sales amount is greater than or equal to 0 300 600 or 1000 and the sales amount is less than 300 600 or 1000 or anything greater than 1000 then the commission rate is 0 2% 2.5 and 3. So let's look at the code to implement that. Uh, let's see here. Get commission. All right. So here's what a nested if statement would look like for this. Now, this looks really, really bad, you guys. I know I'm going to show you guys a better way in a sec. Uh, but this is one way that we could solve that problem. If sales is less than 300, then the rate is zero. Else, so anything other, if, if sales is 300 or greater, um, then we also say if sales is less than 600, then the rate's this. Uh, else, uh, I could say if sales is less than 1,000, then the rate's that. Now, the big thing here is to watch where these curly braces start and end. All right, this would perform very differently if these weren't nested. But they are nested because if I look at this curly brace on the else statement, thank heavens for, for, for VS Code and for other text editors that show me where braces start and end. And it even highlighted this little line right here to say, hey, um, the else statement starts and ends here. Okay, and if I if I click right here, it'll put a box around this curly brace and this curly brace, letting me know that everything is in here. Okay, uh, same thing here. This one starts here and ends here. It just puts a little box around them, which is really really nice to look at. All right, now uh, let's run this in the browser real quick. Copy path. And our sales, we're going to say are 450. I'm going to put a breakpoint in here, and we're going to watch this thing run. Okay, so rates undefined, sales is 450. Sales less than 300, true or false? False. So we'll skip this, and then we'll go into our else block because we only have an if else statement here. And so we'll go into this else block of code. So F10, it comes down to line 20. Is sales less than 600? True or false? That is true. Okay. Then we'll go into here and then we'll skip this else, regardless of nested if else statements. We don't care. 
Okay. If we come into here, then we'll skip the rest of this else statement. So F10, we assign rate, and then it skips down to the very bottom and skips the rest of this. Okay. And then, but we had our rate of 0 0.02, and then we'll multiply that by the sales and we get a commission of, of nine. Okay. Uh, now let's look at a, a better way to do this. Um, with, with this example, if I come back over here, uh, I could very easily say, um, else if sales is less than 600 and then delete both of these. Okay, and then right here, instead of having a nested if statement there as well, I could say, else if sales is less than a thousand and I'll delete both of those. And I just need a curly brace here and here. Okay, and then this else statement, I can probably just remove both of those and then redo this indent. Okay, uh, where we're only dealing with that one variable, this will do the exact same thing as what we saw a second ago. Uh, we can put the closing brace on the same line as our next else if or else, or you can do this. Either is fine. I wouldn't recommend having them both right here. I would say pick one, okay? Either do it like this or do it like this. Either one's fine. I prefer it like this because it saves a line of code for each one, but that's just my personal preference. Either one work, either, they both work. All right, uh, sporting games. Now, looking at this one, sports teams provides discounts to tickets to students and seniors and rewards fans that attend multiple games. Uh, is there a table? There is a table. Okay, good. So now this is different. If we look at our first table, uh, we have amount of sales and that's it. And then we assign a commission rate. Uh, this one though, we have two variables that we're looking at. We have age and games attended. All right, so we have age zero through 17. There are three tiers, depending on how many games they've attended, zero to five, six to 10 or 11 or more. Uh, and then we have two tiers for 18 and 54 and then two tiers for our seniors. And we have to be able to um, have all of this in our program. So if I was gonna look at that, all right, I have, this is a good case, uh, a, a good example of when we might wanna use a nested if statement. All right, because I have, if age is less than 18, all right, then I have my three conditions for how many games they've attended if their age is less than 18. If age is less than 55, then I have my two conditions and everything else, I have my two conditions. Now, the way this works, Right here, I could say age is greater than or equal to 18, whoops, and age is less than 55. The reason why I don't have to do that is because if this is true, if age is less than is if age is less than 18, then this code will run and the rest of it will get skipped. So if age is not less than 18, then I know that this line of code will get touched because this was false. So I know the age is not less than 18. So right here, I can just say, okay, uh, it's not less than 18. So if it's less than 55, which is the same thing as saying, if age is anywhere from 18 to 54, okay? Because this had to have been false for me to enter here. Same logic here, all right? I'm saying else, here's the senior prices, okay? Because it's not less than 18, it's not less than 55, which leaves 55 and up. Um, for this else statement. Okay, so let's run this real quick. Um, I'm gonna copy this path Come over to here, paste it, and I'm gonna open up my debugger, and I'm gonna say we are 19 years old and we have attended 21 games. Okay, uh, we're already parsing these integers. Age is 19, games is 21, price is undefined. Uh, is 19 less than 18? False. So what line of code will get hit next after I hit F10? What do you guys think? The other one with the age, the else if age less than 55? Yes, yes. Don't let all the if statements throw you off. Okay. If this isn't true, we don't care about what's in here. 
could be a billion if statements or switch statement, we don't care, all right? If this is true, then we care. But if it's false, then we'll go to the curly brace that closes that if statement, and then we'll go into the next line of code, okay? So F10, we go to the next line of code after that if statement, uh, is 19 less than 55? True, so if I hit F10, which is our next line of code that we're gonna hit? Line 27. Perfect, yes, line 27. And then we're never even gonna to touch this, okay? Because it's in the same tier as our if statement here, our else if, and our else, all right? Using indentation, it makes it really easy to see that. All right, I can see where my nested stuff is, and I can see that right now, you know, I'm in this if statement and this else if block. And so if this is gonna be true, then we're never gonna to touch any of this, okay? but. 19 is less than 55, we're gonna go into here. And then is 21 less than 11? That's false. So I hit F10, where's it gonna go? What line of code? Line 30. Line 30, yep. Because now that this is nested, this if statement doesn't care about this else statement. They are not related at all. This if statement is only related to this else statement, okay? So if this is false, then we're gonna go into this else statement and then to line 30, okay? Then we'll assign our price. We'll hit F10. Our next line of code that we're gonna hit, we already talked about how we're gonna skip all of this. So we should just go straight to line 40 after this. And that my friends is selection at its finest, okay? Um, nested if statements can get really hairy. Uh, it's really hard to make sure that you get every case uh, accounted for, all right? Which is why these else statements are really important, okay? Um, but that's just one more example. Uh, let's see, a bunch of ifs and an else. That's way more simple than the one we just looked at. Uh, so let's just ask, this is my last question for today. Since we have one more minute left, one, one minute left of class. Uh, so what will be that message at the end of this? If you look at this, what will be message? Uh, hang on a sec. We need some, uh, some preface. Let's actually run this. Because it'll depend on what X and Y are. So let me copy this path and come over in here, paste it, and let's look here. Okay, and I'm gonna say uh, x equals six and y equals seven, okay? If x is six and y is seven, what will message be at the end of this? I think it's wave. Okay, let's try it. I'm going to put a breakpoint here. Message is declared as wave to start. Is x equal to 2? x is 6, so that's false. x is still 6, so that's false. And then our message ended up being goodbye. Okay, now if I put right here 5 and 7, if we look here, message is declared as wave. We go into this else if statement because uh, right here we're comparing a string with an integer. If you've seen a triple equal sign, that's the difference, okay? This right here will equate to true, even though five as a string is not technically exactly the same as the number, uh, this double equals does not take into account type, all right? If I had a triple equals, then it would be false because a string of five is not the same as the number five. But with my double equals, it is the same. And so we skip this else statement, message never changes, it's still wave. And that's how that would work. Okay, you guys, any last questions before I let you guys go? We're starting to get into some really fun stuff. I know that sometimes the hard stuff is fun stuff also. Um, it's not really fun until you figure out the hard stuff. So hang in there while you're figuring it out. The more you practice, the better you'll get. All right, you can totally come over here into the console and be like, oh, if I say uh, if 
x is less than five, you know, you can write out code here and just test it out if you want to, or you can run it in VS code and with your browser. Okay. Um, but yeah, any questions you guys have just post on the help channel. Uh, yeah, I hope you guys have a great week. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for being here. Have a good Thanks day. Thanks for the birch. You too. Bye you guys. Thanks.